allow me to begin with a story from... I was about to say long ago, but it really wasn't. I had a seasonal job, and there was this one co-worker. I'm going to call him Ben, just in case he doesn't want his name to be known. Anyways, Ben had a few screws loose in his head. He drank about four Monster Energy drinks a day, and he loved the Soulsborne series, challenging games marketed to masochists. He would say things like, Dark Souls Remastered is easy, as he drank enough caffeine to kill a cow. So, when the same game developer that made the Soulsborne games released a new game, he was one of the first to get a copy. When I asked him about the game, he would say, Oh, it's harder than Dark Souls! I don't know if he was trying to dissuade me from getting this game, or if he was just having a hard time with it. Anyways, one day I was working, and he was walking by. I wanted to say hi, but I stopped when I saw him. His eyes were almost bulging out of his skull. His hands were shaking, probably from all the caffeine, and he was muttering almost incoherently. Out of the muttering, I was able to hear one recurring word. Sekiro. So, yeah, after that encounter, I became very interested in this new game. So, after it won Game of the Year, not that it means much anymore, and all of 2020 happened, I decided to buy the game, and I really shouldn't have done that because I have fallen hopelessly in love with this game. And despite how soul-crushingly difficult it can be at times, it was still enough fun to lure me back over and over again, just so the game could beat me down one more time. So, what was it that drove me to bang my head against a wall over and over again? Well, it has tons of fun lore, and a story that people can actually follow without the aid of the internet. But besides all that, it has something that all video games should strive for. Good gameplay. Sekiro has some of the best gameplay I have ever seen, and we might be seeing some design elements of Sekiro's gameplay working into the upcoming Elden Ring. So, without any more delay, allow me to go in-depth why the game design of Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is so awesome. Man, this intro is really long. As the title of Sekiro Shadows Die Twice implies, it means that you have two chances to die to your enemies with one resurrection in between. It's a great idea that opens up many possibilities for the game. These bosses are tough as nails, and they can often kill the player in as little as two or one hits. But with this resurrection mechanic, you are able to learn from your mistakes faster than you were able to in older games. When you get killed by that one perilous attack, you are then able to revive and go after that victory again. However, this doesn't make the game easier. You only get one resurrection at a time, and in order to gain the chance to revive, you will either have to sacrifice extremely rare resources or by getting up and performing a difficult death blow on that one boss. And even then, that boss battle isn't over, since most bosses will have multiple health bars that need to be dealt with before a victory is won. However, besides giving the gameplay something interesting to make it stand out from other games, it does something else. It influences the story. Game developers often focus on the main story of their games before they ever consider how the game will play. This often leads to disconnects between the story and the gameplay. However, the best games will merge the gameplay mechanics of their stories in order to create a unified experience. Sekiro does this by focusing its plot around this mechanic of resurrection. In the story of Sekiro, the character known as the Wolf is escaping Ashina Castle with his master, who is also known as the Divine Heir, only to be intercepted by a man known as Genichiro. Wolf is defeated by Genichiro and dies, only to later be revived by unknown circumstances. It's, it is later revealed that the Wolf's master has given Wolf his divine blood. This blood is what allows the Wolf to continually revive after death and it is the same blood that Genichiro needs. Genichiro needs to be able to fight an outside force known as the Interior Ministry, and he plans to use the Divine Heir's blood to win this war. It then becomes the Wolf's task to rescue the Divine Heir from Genichiro. However, this resurrection mechanic doesn't stop there. As it turns out, the origin of this resurrection power comes from a divine dragon who was set loose from its homeland and drifted to, J to Japan, and has now made Japan its home. 
From this dragon, water with the power of resurrection has begun to flow across the land, corrupting the inhabitants within. All of this is connected with the central mechanic of resurrection, to the point where it has become the theme of the game. But just coming back to life isn't where this mechanic ends. The more you die, the faster a mysterious illness known as Dragon Rot begins to infect non-player characters, or NPCs of this game. It is later revealed that the player is the reason this illness is spreading. The more players die, the blood of the divine air siphons the life energy from others in order for the wolf to continually revive. That's right, this game doesn't just punish you for failing by taking half your cash and XP, it also takes your failure out on the characters around you. What a kick in the balls! Back to being serious, it's great that From Software went so in depth with this mechanic. It takes the idea of resurrection from a gimmick to a pivotal part of the world building, story, and gameplay. And yet, this is only the first part of the awesome stuff this game contains. Sekiro is often referred to as harder than any of the Soulsborne games developed by From Software. But why is that? Why is this game more difficult than what came before it? Well, the reason is because the gameplay is very different from the previous Soulsborne games, leading to a high skill requirement while playing. It also doesn't help that all the enemies in this game move super fast. In Dark Souls and Bloodborne, you are able to customize the character you play to whatever you like. You can equip that giant sword or tiny daggers, or put on all the costumes you can in order to turn Dark Souls into Fashion Souls. And when that one challenge seems just a little too hard, you can always turn to the doll in the Hunter's Dream and, through the power of prostitution, level up your character. I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself with that joke. But that doesn't happen in Sekiro. All players are given the same character, the wolf, who is rotting away at the bottom of a well before being given the one sword you will be using for the rest of the game. Because of this, From Software was able to create a combat system that would permeate the entire game, and could be fine-tuned into a tense flurry of blades. You see, blocking and parrying enemy attacks is emphasized more in Sekiro than in other games in the Soulsborne series. Yeah, it prevents the player from taking damage, but this parry system is emphasized even more in the posture meter. In almost every video game, there is some manner of health indication, most commonly found in the health bar. But Sekiro adds another bar to monitor in the form of the posture meter. The player's posture is built up when the player blocks an enemy's attack or takes damage but the enemy also has their own posture bar that can be built up by either attacking the enemy or by parrying the enemy's attacks. Once the enemy's posture bar is built up, players are then capable of performing a death blow, which instantly kills enemies. But be careful, not all attacks are capable of being blocked. Some enemies have special attacks known as perilous attacks. These attacks are signaled by a glowing red symbol appearing above the player's head. Kind of like Percy Jackson, if getting recognized by your divine parent was then followed by a lethal punch to the face. There are three types of perilous attacks. Grabs, thrusts, and sweep attacks. Grabs can't be parried. The only thing you can do is spam buttons or run in the other direction, hoping your foe doesn't use the force on you. However, thrusts can be countered with the Mikiri counter, a skill that you can unlock and is performed by pressing the A button, or the B button. Wait, the layouts on controllers are different depending on the console. Uh, the one that's to the east, or the right button, the one that lets you dash. There you go. The Mikiri counter also causes build-up to your foe's posture meter, and then sweeping attacks. You stop these by jumping into the air and then kicking your foe in the face. But there is one other form of attack that I haven't talked about yet, lightning reversal. In the game, you will occasionally encounter bosses and enemies that are capable of using lightning attacks. To parry these, the player needs to jump into the air and catch the lightning. But be careful, if the player lands on the ground after catching the lightning, the shock will rush to the ground dealing massive amounts of damage. 
players must jump into the air, catch the lightning, and before they hit the ground, they must reverse the lightning attack at their foe. This game is fun. So go out there and parry, stab, and counter your foes into oblivion. But remember, the posture meter will decrease with your inactivity, and in some fights it can decrease fast. The best way to slow down the decreasing posture meter is by dealing damage to the enemy's health bar. The lower an enemy's health is, the slower the posture meter will deplete. This posture mechanic also leads to interesting fights where you need to focus more on either dealing damage to an enemy's health or countering their attacks to build up the posture meter. So in summary, sword combat in Sekiro requires players to constantly be attacking, parrying, and countering attacks all while reducing the health of foes in order to keep the posture up while the players deal with not dying at the same time. Presented like that, it makes sense why so many people have a hard time playing this game. Players need to constantly be taking part in combat, with the focus that could filter out a hungry German Shepherd barking in your face. And yet, in the end, the euphoric rush of kicking in the teeth of that one boss who has been killing you for the past hour is one of the best sensations ever. Since Sekiro Shadows Die Twice has only one weapon, the trusty and probably very rusty katana, from Software needed to introduce more nuanced forms of customization. This came in the form of the Shinobi prosthetic. It was the first thing that we saw when this game was announced. Everyone kept saying it was Bloodborne 2, but it turned out to be this instead. A full replacement for the wolf's missing arm that probably gives people splinters when he shakes someone's hand. Hmm, that joke could have turned out better. But jokes aside, this is one of the coolest components of Sekiro's gameplay. The prosthetic arm can be used to grapple onto tree branches, roofs, and ledges in order to have greater verticality than any game that has come from From Software. Many areas in the game are lacking proper pathways through them, making the prosthetic arm one of the most indispensable and reliable tools in the game. There's no way that you could make it through this game without it. I mean, just look at the wolf before he loses his arm. The design of his left arm before it is cut off is just begging to be replaced. But its utility doesn't end there, because of the use of shinobi tools. Across the land of Ashina, there exists upgrades for the prosthetic arm. These can then be equipped by the sculptor in the dilapidated temple. The assortment of tools that can be acquired is honestly astounding. It ranges from teleporting with the mist raven feathers, poison blades, a flaming axe, a giant flamethrower, and irresponsible use of fireworks. There's even an upgrade that allows you to throw money at your foes, and it somehow damages them. However, like most things I have talked about in this video, the shinobi prosthetic is far more complicated and versatile than what it first seems. There are lots of enemies in this game, and many of these opponents have bolstered defenses, and some exploitable weaknesses. If a bandit is cowering behind his shield, thinking he's invincible, players can use the shinobi axe to cleave the shield into splinters and kill the nuisance where he stands. The loaded umbrella can be used to block incoming attacks, and there are even versions of this tool that allow for defense against fire and terror buildup. There are certain enemies in the game who wear armor, but that armor can be ripped off with the use of the loaded spear. The Sabimaru inflicts poison on enemies who are vulnerable to it, enemies with red eyes are vulnerable to fire, as well as all the other foes who have been affected by the water corrupting the land that I mentioned at the beginning of this video. Beast type enemies who are relentlessly attacking the player can be interrupted with the shinobi firecracker tool. Actually, almost every enemy in this game is vulnerable to the firecracker's power! The use of these tools opens up numerous new ways to play and experience the game, and opens up unique ways of customizing how people can play this game. The shinobi prosthetic is like a Swiss army knife that has replaced the wolf's left arm. What an awesome way to play. So, in summary, the resurrection mechanic is expanded upon to become a driving part of the gameplay and story, Combat has been overhauled to stim simulate the flurry of clashing blades in fast-paced and complex combat, and the shinobi prosthetic adds another layer of exploration and combat by exploiting enemy defenses and weaknesses. Sounds about right to me. 
Ah, snacks. I just realized that I didn't have a chance to talk about the stealth in Sekiro. Dang it! The last time I made a video about Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice, or any Soulsborne game, it became my least watched video. So, since the last time was so successful, I decided to re revisit this game again. Anyways, if you enjoyed the video, hit the like button, share with the people who you know because YouTube doesn't like to share my stuff or any other small channel, and subscribe if you, if you feel like it. Or you won't do that because, let's face it, not many people will have watched this part of the video. So good job if you are still watching. Thanks for watching, have a nice day or night depending on when you are watching this, try not to inflict the rest of the world with Dragonrot, and bye.